Really happy to be here in Herlin, Netherlands with Drs. Matthias Rath and Dr. Alexandra Nidwitsky. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, I'm really excited to get your perspective. You've been sharing some things before the, the interview here with your treatment protocol. Before we get into that, though, uh, I'll start with you, Dr. Rath. Would you just share your, your education and how you got into medicine? These are two different questions. <laughs> I got into medicine because I come from a very humanistic family. And uh, it was a vocation, an interest uh, to help others. As I moved along, I realized, of course, that medicine is something different. But I tried to keep, uh, until this day, I tried to keep this very essence of uh, serving others, as we will reflect on this interview. I graduated from the University of Hamburg in Germany as a medical doctor. I uh, held positions at uh, the university there, University Clinic in Hamburg, later moved to the German Heart Center in Berlin before accepting the position of head of cardiovascular research at the Linus Pauling Institute, which of course led into various fields of research, including cancer, uh, as a sequence of that. Dr. Alexandra? Uh, same, same question. Okay. <laughs> I have a PhD in biochemistry from the University of Warsaw in Poland. And uh, later on, I did my postdoctoral work in the field of molecular biology of cell division at the Rockefeller University in New York. And then later I started uh, my work in the area of uh, mechanisms of aging at the University of Toronto in Canada. And uh, aging projects actually brought me to work uh, to uh, continue my work at the Linus Pauling Institute in Palo Alto. Okay. That's where we met and uh, a few years later we decided to uh, launch our own research organization after the death of uh, Professor Pauling and that's what connects us, uh, what has been connecting us over the past two decades. Yeah and we started working on common projects on, in the area of heart disease, the role of micronutrients in heart disease and expanded to cancer and also infectious diseases and other uh, chronic, mostly chronic health problems that people suffer today. You mentioned uh, Dr. Pauling, Linus Pauling. Uh, most people realize that he was associated with vitamin C. Is this, when you mention micronutrients, is, is vitamin C a micronutrient or what exactly do you mean by micronutrients? Yes, vitamin C uh, is a micronutrient. Uh, generally, micronutrients comprise vitamins, minerals, trace elements, certain amino acids, uh, phytochemicals or phytobiologicals, uh, as we call them, extracts from plants, small molecules that have a distinct metabolic role in the cells of the body. We're fighting a war on cancer that began in 1972, I think, according to President Nixon. So does it make sense to you to be fighting a war? Because in a war, there's people dying. I mean, is that the right approach to have a war on cancer, uh, Dr. Nidwitsky? Yeah, there are so many casualties of this war. And uh, the end of this war is not even in sight. And uh, one of the reasons uh, why this war continues is the money that are being made uh, in this war. And uh, this uh, refers to the treatments, so-called treatments, that are being used in cancer, namely chemotherapy and radiation. Chemotherapy uh, uses the most powerful toxin, toxins no, known to uh, humans, and these toxins, of course, are being sold to us as substances that can uh, kill cancer cells. But uh, these substances also kill, annihilate 
uh, healthy cells in the body damage its organs, which make uh, the recovery from cancer almost a uh, miracle, <laughs> impossible. And also, this, the very substances that are being used to fight cancer are cancer-causing chemicals. So instead of eliminating cancer or curbing cancer, we are inducing, uh, generating new cancers. Mm. Not a bad business model if you're in it for the money. Uh, big pharmaceutical companies producing the drugs to treat cancer that are then actually causing cancer. Dr. Rath, I've seen you ri you've written extensively about big pharmaceutical companies. What, what do you think about that? Unfortunately, Ty, you're right. Hmm. We all think that the pharmaceutical industry um, has been around for ages to take care of the health problems of humanity. Try to alleviate suffering and uh, prevent death. Very few know that the birth hour of the pharmaceutical industry is actually a deliberate decision by a handful of people on this side and on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean to define disease as a marketplace and build what has now become the largest investment industry upon that simple thought. So cancer is just one element of this uh, unspeakable business of defining diseases as a marketplace. Everything else that you see today around the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the uh, tremendous profits, uh, the inability to eliminate diseases, uh, the propaganda war from that side that they are actually making progress in any disease, all of that comes from the fact that it's a business model, an investment industry that thrives on the continuation of existing diseases and the launching of new diseases. And Dr. Nitzwicki just mentioned one trick that they use. They produce patented synthetic drugs from which they know that sooner or later they cause new diseases by the mere side effects. So as you say, it's a fantastic business model. And maybe one aspect is important too for the audience, and that is the principle of patentability. In other words, once you define a business as an investment business, you have to define the return on investment. In the pharmaceutical industry, these are patent fees, royalties. And then the next step is, how do you get a patent? You only get a patent if you do something new. And most of the patents in the pharmaceutical industry therefore relate to synthetically defined new drugs, artificially created. In other words, the body doesn't know them, these molecules, and treats them as toxins. And in many cases, our organs are not able to detoxify them, and there you have it. As a result of this business model, of being an investment industry, you have uh, this uh, avalanche of side effects factored into this business model. Yeah, and another aspect is that the majority of drugs that are being used to treat our diseases are uh, the drugs that treat only symptoms, not underlying causes of diseases, just to make sure that uh, the, your numbers looks better and there is less uh, cholesterol or uh, sugar in your blood, but the, the disease continues. So this is symptom-oriented medicine, contrary to what we've been uh, working on, which is cause-oriented uh, approach, where we look what is the underlying cause of uh, diseases or health problems and eliminate their causes. And the other aspect is also a monopoly on uh, treatment. Only pharmaceutical conventional medicine is uh, the medicine that is uh, officially approved and acclaimed. And people who try to find other solutions are 
uh, have difficulties when it comes to insurance coverage and other problems. So mm. maintaining monopoly on treatment is also one of the ways to protect and grow this business. Mm. Because it's an investment business. Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. It's sad that people's lives are being lost because of money, because of the underlying, the underlying greed of the industry. You mentioned um, chemotherapy. And Dr. Rath, you just were telling me before the interview, you were recently in Auschwitz. And is it true, I've, I've heard that the origins of the first chemotherapy drugs were from the, the World Wars, the, the gases that were used in the World Wars. Is this true? It's very true. The uh, um, first chemotherapy commercialized by Bayer was actually the same substance that they produced for the German army in World War I. Um, it was mustard gas. Uh, it was the replacement of one molecule in this gas molecule from uh, uh, being used as a tool to, of mass extermination. A chemical weapon is a weapon to kill thousands at one time. And uh, a few years later, this substance turns up as a chemotherapy drug. Um, it underlines again the uh, principle of business. Um, you can produce and make millions by selling weapons to the army. And uh, then when the war is over, you look for new applications of this drug. In this case, the unfortunate decision was taken to apply it for the alleged treatment of cancer. In fact, as Dr. Netzwicki pointed out, it is a uh, business model. It's not a treatment. The intention is to give the impression that something goes away. And it may go away for a few months, but uh, the real mass mega death in the field of cancer patients is happening after six months or nine months uh, when uh, this initial effect uh, of doing away with the tumor uh, breaks down and the cancer comes back massively uh, even more than before because now the immune system is dead and uh, no one talks about that so um, yes we were in Auschwitz uh, because we have a friendship with uh, some of the survivors that are still alive from that time. And it is, uh, since you asked me this question, I may just uh, um, spend a moment on uh, something that is very little known about Auschwitz. We've been told in the history book it was a camp that uh, was built to annihilate uh, 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 Jewish people and uh, uh, Slavic people and uh, people that uh, the Nazis didn't like in the conquered countries. But uh, what made Auschwitz the uh, mega death extermination camp was actually uh, the decision by Bayer, Höchst and BASF to build the largest industrial plant of wartime in Europe. Uh, it is called IG Auschwitz, a 100% subsidiary uh, of Bayer Höchst and BASF and uh, the plant uh, uh, was eight kilometers long, about five miles long and uh, two miles wide. So it's a, a giant uh, uh, industrial area and the um, Birkenau concentration camp, the, the huge camp that was featured in Schindler's List in that movie, was a deliberate decision uh, to uh, supply slave labor for the construction of this industrial plant. So without uh, the interest that we just touched upon that put profits over lives, Auschwitz would never have had this meaning. The decision of Wannsee, which uh, was the decision by the Nazi, uh, Nazis to exterminate the Jewish people, was taken roughly one year after the decision of IG Farben to build this plant. So the Nazis used the death apparatus that was already existing because of the slave labor uh, camp being in existence. The, the chimneys were burning, uh, 
uh, IG Farben was uh, not taking care uh, of, uh, uh, of the sick people. The, after three months on average, uh, the people were uh, emacerated. And so they were just put to the gas chamber and uh, shut up in the chimney. So um, I used a few more uh, sentences than the normal uh, to exemplify if we are talking today that there is an industry among humanity that sacrifices millions of lives or puts them at risk for profit, we are sometimes, you included, being attacked as being out of this world, conspiracy people. Now, we turn around, we look at Auschwitz, we look at the industrial plant, we look at the concentration extermination plan being built, initially built, to serve as slave labor camp for that purpose. And we can say, they've done it before. Yeah, to add to it, <clears throat> there were employees of Bayer, uh, doctors, who were conducting medical experiments <coughs> on prisoners and in uh, testing a uh, variety of drugs that are being sold until this day. So they were tested on innocent people in the inhumane conditions in the name of profit. And these were not crazy and uh, cruel SS doctors who conducted those experiments. These were employees. These were employees of the uh, pharmaceutical company Bayer. And we have a website, uh, Profit Over Life, that uh, presents uh, original documents from the Nuremberg uh, trial of IG Farben, and where all this information is available. And uh, we are encouraging everybody who watches this movie to go and learn about uh, historic truth. Mm. I'm a German. I didn't learn anything about that. I was 35 years old when I learned about Bayer, BASF, the largest pharmaceutical companies at that time were actually building or responsible for the uh, extermination camp in, at Auschwitz. And um, then I wanted to know more and there was nothing. So we finally found in uh, the archives of the U.S. Uh, in Washington, the U.S. Uh, National Library, the records of uh, case number six of the Nuremberg war crime tribunals. We are told that this was only one tribunal against the main war criminals, but in fact there were 12. Number six was against Bayer, BASF and Höchst. At, the same, at that time they were uh, forming a cartel by the name of IG Farben. And that uh, whole case lasted a, an entire year against 24 managers of these pharmaceutical and chemical companies. And it showed that they were largely financing the rise of the Nazis to power, that they supplied 100% of the raw materials so that the Nazis could lead their war, including 100% of the synthetic gasoline, rubber, 100% uh, of the explosives. Uh, the, the report came to the conclusion, the US prosecutor said, without IG Farben, World War II would not have been possible. In other words, we have to redefine history. Even if we talk about cancer today, we need to know those things. That these interests for expanding patented product markets worldwide, they were risking eventually, they were responsible for the death of 60 million people in World War II. And um, that shows you the dimension of the topic that we are talking about today. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, that uh, these interests will not do uh, if the profit is high enough then and now. Yeah, and the, those activities didn't end with the war and with the Nuremberg process because uh, the uh, head of uh, Bayer Pharmaceutical Company who was sentenced to uh, seven, I guess, six or seven years of prison was uh, released after two years and for mm. the next 10 years he ch served as a chairman of the board for the same company Bayer. So there are many ex other examples. Uh, the head of the company uh, Degesh that was providing the gas 
Cyclone B uh, used to gas uh, innocent people, uh, the same return to his position. But talking about making the connection to uh, our topic today, uh, Dr. Nitzwicki mentioned uh, Fritz Termer, the uh, uh, um, head of uh, Bayer, uh, who was sentenced for six years in Nuremberg and uh, returned to the position of supervisory board of, um, of Bayer, uh, essentially immediately after the war. So a war criminal, a convicted war criminal, becomes head of the largest pharmaceutical company at that time. During the first half of the 20th century, no less than nine Nobel Prizes were rewarded or awarded for vitamin research for the benefit of vitamins for human health. In 1963, the German government, under pressure of Bayer, under pressure of then the supervisory board head Fritz Tamer, launched what is called a Codex Alimentarius Commission with the goal to make sure that vitamins and the benefits of vitamins for human health are being eliminated worldwide. So you can see it is not just you and us talking about cancer. There's a, a century-long uh, tradition of crime against human health. And when you follow that track, a lot of the things we will be talking about today um, will become easier to understand for the people that uh, watch this interview. Wow. So they've done it before. It shouldn't surprise us that they're still doing it now. Very true. Yeah, and chemotherapy business is also a wonderful example of multiplicator <laughs> because uh, the side effects that chemotherapy produces is the uh, you know, reservoir for prescribing other drugs, bone marrow transplants. This is the results of chemotherapy, bleeding from the intestines uh, that requires drug, anti-nausea uh, drugs, and uh, many others, uh, changes in the brain. There is even a term for it, it's called chemo brain, because the chemotherapy affects you know, so many organs in the body, and it's the uh, reason for prescribing more drugs. So chemotherapy multiplies the business and this is why it lasts f until this day. It's wow. hard to imagine. It huh? is. It is. But you know, thank you for sharing the history there because it's really the, it's the history that's been rewritten, right? The history that we are taught now is not what actually happened. Tai, if we are not learning from history, and I'm quoting a philosopher, we are sentenced to relive it again. And uh, I wasn't born a, as a historian. Uh, I was a scientist, a doctor. And after publishing these initial uh, new concepts on cancer and heart disease with uh, Linus Pauling, um, I felt the world will embrace us. They will say, this is great. Fact is, we were being fought for every single advance in natural health. There were more than a hundred lawsuits that the status quo, the pharmaceutical lobby, has been bringing against myself, Dr. Nitzwicki, our research, over the past 15 years. More than a hundred times we were dragged into the courtrooms for one goal. These interests did not want us to talk today, mm. or for that matter, to inform you what we have found out about the most common diseases can be greatly reduced, uh, maybe eventually largely eliminated with the knowledge we have today. The fact that we are doing this interview now shows they didn't succeed. And the main reason why we succeeded, actually summarizing it in one word, was science. We could prove it. So if we will touch upon the scientific details later on of our research, they have been jacked in, uh, in more than 100 litigations for their validity, for their truth, and for their use uh, for the people on this planet. 
So it's science-based natural medicine. That's yes. what it is. Mm -hmm. Science-based. Science-based and uh, quote validated, uh, if you want it. Oh, a hundred times. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we call it cellular medicine cellular because medicine. we look at the beginning or, or development of health and, and disease at the level of smallest units of our body, which are cells. And uh, our study uh, shows that the underlying cause of majority of chronic diseases, diseases that develop over years or even decades, is the long-term deficiency of micronutrients, uh, vitamins, trace elements, some amino acids, or other active components which cause dysfunction, cellular dysfunction, that with time uh, turns into a diseased organ and, and disease. And therefore, sin since we know the underlying cause of uh, these health problems, we also can develop effective solutions to alleviate those. Mm -hmm. So the, with cancer specifically, you know, you look over the last hundred years, the, the lack of micronutrients being one of the causes makes a lot of sense because look at the, the depleted soils, the food's no longer food, it's being genetically modified and so forth. It makes sense that we would have a lack of micronutrients in our bodies now. And maybe that's one of the reasons that we've had this, this uh, increase in cancer. Dr. Nidzwicki, you were talking about the fact that even though the statistics might say otherwise, we, there's a huge explosion in cancer over yes. the last several decades. Today, I think everybody knows somebody who got diagnosed with cancer or died of cancer, maybe in our families or, or friends. So there is a tremendous explosion of cases of cancer that exactly rela relates to the pollution, chemical pollutions of our environment, uh, soil, food, that we eat uh, all the processed foods that uh, when you read the label you don't understand half of the ingredients mm -hmm. that are in but all of them have impact on the metabolism of cells it is known that certain micronutrients such as for instance vitamin c protects uh, our dna against the damage that can trigger development of cancer and many other micronutrients act at the uh, uh, genetic level, and uh, there have been studies showing that micronutrients also help alleviate uh, very, uh, many diseases that are, are of genetic origin that, uh, 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 that stem from so-called pleiotropic effect, not the lack of a, a gene but uh, small activity of certain enzymes which are uh, coded by the genes. And micronutrients applied in larger quantities are effective in alleviating those symptoms. So. And even, even in, in cancer, correct? Exactly. Yeah. So let, let's, uh, you're talking about cells. What is a cancer cell? What, what exactly is cancer? Uh, what exactly is cancer? Cancer uh, is an... Uh, a process that occurs in our body all the time. So as we are sitting and talking, there are cancer cells that are constantly created in our body. They do not always lead to the development of cancer because our immune system finds them as abnormal cells and eliminates them. And cancer cell is a cell that escaped biological control that uh, is uh, uh, to which all normal cells in our body are subjected. So cancer cells divide indefinitely. And also cancer cells are immortal. They never die because the genetic program that uh, uh, regulates life and death cycle in those cells uh, has been damaged. And cancer cells also have another ability they are not happy in sitting in one spot in our body. They invade uh, uh, our organs and also they metastasize, which means that they uh, escape to other organs. And metastasis is the most dangerous process of cancer because nine out of 10 patients die of metastasis, not of primary cancer. And metastasis is the a stage of cancer or process of cancer 
for which there are no treatment. And what is also interesting, there is no much scientific interest in studying metastasis because about five, maybe now 10% of funds uh, for cancer research from uh, National Cancer Institute is directed to study metastasis. Imagine the, uh, the process that kills 90% of cancer patients is not studied in the same proportion. A very small percentage is directed to study metastasis. Hmm. It's it's kind of the the inverse, right? Exactly. The largest percentage yeah. is, is is used to fund the 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 cancer that is not yet spread. Yeah, and so or forth. find drugs that eliminate cancer. Right, and I think it probably goes back. You were mentioning earlier the difference between treating symptoms versus the cause, right? You you treat the you treat the tumor, you can get a reduction in the tumor size, and everything seems to be happy. And but then, as Dr. Rath said, it always comes back because yeah. you haven't really f affected the cause. So when you're looking at micronutrients for cancer, Dr. Rath, does, do micronutrients have any kind of effect on a cancer that might be spreading or metastasizing? Well, yes, it does in several ways. Perhaps it is uh, important to go one step back and explain how cancers spread. Yeah, what you were telling me before, absolutely, and, yes. Um, it relates to what Dr. Nitzvicki just said. I believe that the largest contribution we made to the field was exactly that, that we said we are not looking at individual types of cancer, but we are looking at the key mechanism that unites them all. Cells, many cells migrate within our body at any time. White blood cells, the police cells, they need to leave the bloodstream and enter, for example, the lung to fight pneumonia or any other organ. We have uh, the egg cell in the monthly cycle of a woman that uh, leaves the ovary and uh, migrates into the uh, fallotian tube. Um, all these processes are extremely tightly controlled because they involve destruction of connective tissue, meaning destructing of tissue that surrounds the cell at that moment, mostly collagen or elastin. And this destruction happens with the help of an enzyme or a group of enzymes, which for simplicity we can call collagenases, collagen digesting enzymes. Under normal circumstances, this mechanism is tightly controlled. Cancer cells use exactly that mechanism, exactly the same group of enzymes to make their way through the body, to migrate through the body, first in their environment, called, we call this invasion, so the tumor grows and spreads, let's say, within the organ of the liver, and then ultimately to migrate into other organs, and we call that step metastasis. In each case, it's the same type of enzyme that uh, paves the way of the uh, cancer cell or cancer cells to migrate. Uh, it's probably like an expedi expeditionary core in the jungle with a macheta. They pave their way through the jungle. And what we found out is that uh, we can block these collagen digesting enzymes. And uh, we understand today the key micronutrients that are able to do that. Not chemotherapy, natural substances that are able to block cancer cells from doing harm to the body. And uh, therefore the approach we are going to talk about a little bit more is not related to an individual type of cancer like breast cancer or prostate cancer. It is a common mechanism that we understand today quite well and that we have developed and tested uh, a composition of micronutrients for uh, in over 50 human cell lines. In other words, any commercial human cancer cell line that is available currently 
uh, we tested those micronutrients and they are effective in each and every case. So we are not just talking about an experience of um, an individual or uh, a, a test group of people. We have been working on this for the last 15 years and Dr. Nitzwicki has been heading this uh, research and has uh, developed it, uh, the group has developed it in, in many areas and I'm sure that you can elaborate on this. Yeah, we published over say, 100 publications, scientific uh, uh, publications in the area of cancer and uh, like Dr. Rath pointed out that our goal was to control the main common mechanism that cancer cells use to spread in the body, to metastasize, but also the same mechanism which is uh, degradation, uh, degradation of connective tissue is being used in the process of angiogenesis, which is formation of new blood vessels that feed the tumor and support tumor growth. So in our approach, uh, uh, we were looking at the substances, natural uh, uh, components, which from one side can inhibit the degradation of connective tissue, inhibit those enzymes that are involved in destroying collagen and other uh, components, but also the uh, substances which can increase the production of connective tissue, increase the strength and the structure of connective tissue in the body. And uh, the group of uh, natural compounds includes, uh, of course, vitamin C as the essential nutrients without which collagen cannot be produced in our body and humans lost the ability to produce internal vitamin C, and also several amino acids uh, and uh, plant uh, extracts and uh, some trace elements. So this is the group of natural compounds that work together in the synergy. And all our work also in other uh, aspects of health includes application of several micronutrients working in synergy. So our studies have shown that this uh, composition of micronutrients is effective in uh, inhibiting key mechanisms that cancer cells uh, or cancer uses in our body. So these micronutrients can inhibit proliferation or growth of cancer cells, inhibit formation of tumors, uh, they can also inhibit the invasion of cancer cells in the tissue. They are effective in inhibiting metastasis. We tested in several cases the metastasis can be inhibited by 70 up to 80 percent. And also they are effective in inhibiting formation of new blood vessels that feed the tumor. Uh, interestingly, uh, this uh, uh, natural mixture of natural compounds is also able to work at the genetic level in cancer cells and convert them from cells which are immortal into cells that start dying. And uh, so this micronutrients can in induce the natural death of cancer cells called apoptosis. And we also published uh, lots of studies uh, supporting uh, uh, this type, type, uh, type of finding. So if uh, we can, uh, what is the beauty of using nutrient synergy is that several mechanisms that are involved in certain pathology can be affected at once, making in case of cancer more difficult for cancer cells to escape this control. Mm. We have uh, mostly here in Europe more than 10,000 uh, uh, patients who are using the Synergy program and some of them have survived uh, the uh, predicted death now for 15 years. Mm. Uh, we have uh, x-ray documentation of uh, many of them, etc. And um, we've summarized this uh, uh, fantastic work that Dr. Netzwigi and her team was, uh, uh, were leading. Uh, in, in a book called Victory Over Cancer. So anyone uh, who wants to uh, get more details on what we're just explaining, uh, it is available for free online 
Uh, everyone can read it anywhere in the world. There are, <clears throat> to our knowledge, to our understanding, uh, there is no uh, more precise mechanism that has been identified as being critical for the control of cancer than the one we just described. There's no program uh, that we are aware of in the field of natural health uh, that is more effective uh, in um, controlling cancer uh, in vivo in, in humans. Um, we're not giving a guarantee, obviously. Uh, that would be uh, not uh, what we uh, ethically should do. Uh, but we, are, we know that there are no uh, science-based programs in natural health uh, that are more effective uh, as we speak. Um, why are we not more uh, outspoken about it? Well, in many cases, patients come to us after they have already done chemotherapy and it didn't work or they had radiation, didn't work, so they come to us with the hope now uh, you can give us a solution. But in most of these cases, the immune system has been destroyed. So in those cases, micronutrients are uh, only able to have an ef a limited effect. So what we understand is that in order for having a maximum chance of fighting and uh, overcoming cancer, uh, we need an intact immune system. And that too uh, makes the current approach of chemotherapy so unethical. It destroys the chemotherapy, the first organ that is affected, actually the target organ uh, is uh, the bone marrow. The destruction of the generation of defense cells, leukocytes, etc., are built in the, uh, in the bone marrow. So from the very onset, from the very planning uh, of chemotherapy, from the very scientific approach, it is a deception. It is an unethical, deceptive business that uh, creates illusions for millions of people. And everyone, every scientist involved in it, I, I'm not blaming the doctors. They sometimes uh, don't have the education uh, 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 to, to go at that length. But, but every scientist knows that it is a huge fraud. And those who say they don't, they should quit the job of being a scientist. And education is the key for, for <coughs> patients, for doctors, for everybody. And this is why we put a big, we emphasize the importance of uh, knowing, in importance of education in the area of natural approaches to health. And this is why we make all our materials, publications, uh, education materials free, available to everyone. Mm. And if somebody wants to know more details about uh, our scientific work, uh, they should go to our research website, www.drathresearch.org, where we uh, have uh, our, we uh, give access to all scientific work that we published in the area of cancer and, of course, in other areas as well. There's an interesting story uh, that uh, mm, shows the transitional time that we are living in. Uh, one of our first patients, that's now almost 20 years ago, uh, who went on the program uh, here in Europe, um, he had lung cancer. And um, uh, he was given half a year to live and put his affairs in order. And he decided to go on this program. And uh, I think uh, six, seven months later, he came back and uh, x-ray was taken and there was no more tumor. So the uh, doctor apologized. He said, you know, sorry, you have to come back a week later. Uh, we need to repair our machine. Uh, it okay. is apparently kaput, mm -hmm. as they say in German. And um, so the gentleman says, sure, I understand. I come back in a, in a week. And uh, they redid the uh, x-ray. It was the same picture. And uh, then uh, the doctor started to uh, try to find other uh, excuses because uh, this was a female doctor. She had not seen anything like that. But uh, our patient, he said, well, I don't think I need to come back. I, I knew 
I know what I've been doing. And uh, that, uh, I'm not telling that to add an episode to this conversation. I'm telling it to underline the transformational time that it is inconceivable for health professionals, for doctors, educated people, that cancer can disappear in a natural way, mm -hmm. just go away. Again, we're not promising that to anyone uh, for sure, but this things that we developed uh, is uh, scientifically speaking the most direct way to uh, have a chance to, to see that happening. Yeah, and we confirmed it in so many uh, different models, not only you know, in vitro studies, uh, but also in vivo studies. And uh, we look at different aspects of it using the same methods, the same tools that pharmaceutical industry is using in testing, developing their drugs. So we, we are not using any magic uh, uh, testing systems, not. And, and our studies are approved in peer-reviewed journals. So, but uh, yes, it's a, it's a change of perception that uh, natural substances can be affecting in controlling many diseases, many pathologies. And, and it, it's a mind, uh, mind uh, set, uh, cha change that it has to occur not only in, in patients, but uh, also in medical profession as well. And I think that we see, especially in the US, that there are more and more doctors who are open into uh, learning more and also applying natural approaches. So it's a, it's a good step, but still there is a lot of work uh, to be done when it comes to education and also when it comes to uh, science supporting the power of uh, natural uh, substances, mm. because there is scientific proof uh, behind it. Take this example that I just mentioned with this lung cancer that disappeared, um, and that couldn't be understood by uh, the doctors. Our research shows we now understand what happened, because micronutrients give, in layman's terms now, give the cancer cell two options. Either you think about how you operate properly and become a healthy cell again, or you die, you commit suicide. And this is this process that Dr. Nitzvicki said, apoptosis. And that happens at a genetic level, and we understand quite a bit about the regulation, how micronutrients go, di go directly to the core of a cancer cell, to the DNA, and challenges the, very, the inner sanctum of this cell uh, into this uh, process. Of course, it is not an intellectual deliberation. It is a forced biological interception. Either you function properly or you commit suicide. And that's really powerful. That is uh, something that no chemical, chemotherapy drug or uh, no uh, uh, synthetic drug uh, can do. And of course, that is, again is a sign for the real power of uh, natural health these regulatory processes, they didn't uh, appear in a reagent glass or, or a petri dish uh, in a laboratory of the pharmaceutical industry 20 years ago or five years ago. These, were, these are processes that nature developed over millennia and this is why they function so distinctly. And we're just about to learn how they work and what substance we need. And um, that is another aspect that uh, we like to emphasize. There are those uh, among our friends in the natural health field that advocate mega, uh, mega doses of vitamins, uh, that you just take one vitamin, for example, vitamin C, and you give it in dosages of um, 100 or 200 grams a day, et cetera. What our research shows is that uh, uh, we, uh, in order to have a maximum effect, uh, as Dr. Netzwicki already uh, um, indicated, uh, we need to understand how these micronutrients work together, like the uh, artists of an orchestra. And when the music plays, uh, that's when we have the max uh, maximum effect. And that's what we call synergy, and that's an essential part of, uh, of cellular medicine. Yeah, and in this aspect, uh, vitamin C megadoses, we also compared in our study the high dose of uh, vitamin C with the vitamin C used in much lower 
those within this nutrient synergy complex and the synergy works better. Mm. Not mentioning that with using multiple nutrients, we can address several mechanisms of cancer at once. Mm. So the final effect yeah. is, uh, is much, much better and, uh, and wider, more pronounced. So could you kind of uh, reiterate these micronutrients that cause cancer, they stop cancer cell growth, they stop the spreading, they stop the blood vessel, the new growth of new blood vessels, the angiogenesis, and that also cause the apoptosis, the programmed cell death. Mm -hmm. what, is, what are these nutrients that have the synergistic components? effect, like the, the orchestra? What are the components of this? Yeah. This? this is uh, uh, vitamin C for you know, simple reasons, uh, since we are targeting the stability and integrity of connective tissue. Without vitamin C, connective tissue cannot be produced. The other uh, compound of this synergy, very powerful uh, component, is amino acid lysine. Lysine is an uh, inhibitor of uh, those uh, collagen digestive enzymes, but also lysine is a component of uh, collagen. Uh, one third of amino acids in collagen are lysine and proline. So it is important uh, that they are included. And lysine, uh, similarly to vitamin C, is not produced in our body. It only comes from the diet. Uh, we are also having other components like an acetylcysteine. We are having trace elements, uh, including copper, selenium. And uh, we are having the active component from green tea called uh, epigallogatechin gallate, or EGC. EGCG uh, for short, and quercetin. So this is the mixture of uh, several components. You can find the information on our website. And this is what uh, we tested them. We tested individual compounds, and also we combined them in the synergy. So uh, there are components acting on different mechanisms in our body, including what we see they also have uh, uh, anti-inflammatory effect. And what we know from one side, uh, inflammation is associated with cancer and also long-lasting in inflammation is the triggering factor for developing cancer. And these micronutrients are also effective in addressing this important aspect. So this is this pleiotropic effect of micronutrient synergy that uh, we are working with. When we had the first proof of the concept that uh, actually micronutrients are the solution to the cancer epidemic, we were thinking about how to present this to the public at large. And we decided to go into USA Today uh, in 2002, in March, and uh, the largest circulation newspaper at the time. And uh, they didn't want to publish. Yeah. So uh, we said, well, but we just presented this information at the breast, can con breast cancer conference in Miami, in Florida. Uh, so why shouldn't you publish things that are there in the scientific community? So finally they did. It was a whole page breakthrough in the natural control of cancer and listing mm -hmm. some of the micronutrients, vitamin C, lysine, proline, and and showing some of the research result in layman's term. Well, uh, that, uh, that did it. Uh, it triggered uh, the war uh, against this breakthrough uh, that I just mentioned before with more than 100 lawsuits, uh, mostly focusing on cancer. Um, the American Medical Association gave uh, media alert about Dr. Roth and his mm. research uh, institute uh, that no media should be publishing anything about uh, uh, our results. Uh, and I thought, how could you deal with such, a uneth such an unethical approach? And we took out another page in a newspaper, a US newspaper, and I wrote an open letter to the president of the American Medical Association saying, well, uh, you are heading an organization that is supposed to do good to the people of America. Here is some uh, advanced uh, research that can actually uh, help benefit uh, millions of people and you are opposing it. Why is this? And I uh, 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 printed his email address at the bottom 
and encourage the readers to uh, send their comments to the president of the AMA. Uh, we've never heard anything about them, so we assume that he got a lot of mails uh, at the time. I'm telling this not to brag about uh, this battle and, and some nice episodes. It, uh, it tells again that uh, it is extremely important to state the truth, to fight for the truth, and this is why we appreciate uh, you coming to us and uh, interviewing us at length on, on this process because it is a courageous thing that you are doing, Ty. And uh, not just with us, but with uh, opening up this, uh, this, uh, this, this curtain uh, of deception and lies uh, about cancer and, and for that matter other diseases and giving the people of America and the world the chance to, to see through that maze of, uh, of deception and make their own joys. I think it's, uh, you, you, you must be complimented. I'm complimenting you for that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank because you. now it's, it's, I think it's even more difficult in uh, fighting for scientific proof, uh, truth. Because in old days, you know, before pharmaceutical industry was created, it was more uh, convincing others to accept the concept. So these were mostly fighting somebody's egos and <laughs> careers. Mm -hmm. But now we are challenging the most powerful industry on earth. So this is not uh, accepting science. And we see from uh, you know, our other contacts that uh, many doctor scientists agree with uh, what we are uh, doing and what we are publishing. Mm. But there is economic aspect and economic pressure, which is very difficult to overcome, and it is only by education, by spreading information and knowledge to people, this is uh, how we can change it. Mm. You know, that's our, with our, uh, with our group, The Truth About Cancer, that's our goal is to educate, mm -hmm. which I appreciate everything that you've shared today because it's very educational. It's to eradicate cancer, which I think that using approaches like this, that's possible, but it's also to expose. Yeah. That's the three E's. Mm -hmm. And so we want to expose this, this beast. And, you know, it, it really seems to me that the real war is actually being fought against people that are offering natural treatments for cancer. I don't think there's a war against cancer. I think it's a war against natural treatments. That's very true. Uh, and there's a reason for that. Um, we talked about concentration camps. They are surrounded by a fence. If someone tries to escape the fences of the modern concentration camp, the ones that confine the cancer patient within the parameter of conventional thinking, of chemotherapy thinking, they are being haunted. How many court cases have been filed around the world for withdrawing custody of parents who went into natural health as opposed to staying within the confines, within the fences, of conventional chemotherapy uh, treatments. It's nothing else. The dimension of a, a, a child dying in a concentration camp or dying from leukemia that is being intoxicated by chemotherapy as opposed to choosing natural paths are the same. The parents are losing a child. The family is losing their future. And that's the, that's the, uh, the, uh, the deeper dimension of what we're talking about, uh, that the same interest groups that have proven again and again in the past, uh, namely the pharmaceutical investment business, um, how ruthless they are, are still around trying to fool us, trying to tell us, well, believe us, why should we? If we don't have the courage to liberate ourselves, uh, then uh, we will not make progress. And, uh, and this is why this is important that this series that you're doing, Ty, is being kept, uh, kept alive. And I, I just can encourage everyone who's, uh, who's uh, seeing that show that uh, you spread it and, uh, and help Ty to uh, get his message uh, around the world and, and uh, not only uh, tame this beast, but, uh, uh, but eliminate it. Not uh, by violence, but by education, by, by becoming aware uh, about these three E's that you mentioned. Yeah. 
we need to recognize that the fear is being used in controlling uh, patients, in controlling society. Fear is a very powerful weapon, and fear of cancer is being used uh, in manipulating uh, in people. And uh, so by uh, educating, by bringing this knowledge to people, explaining both the uh, basis of the problem, but also, you know, showing about uh, <coughs> possibility of uh, new solutions to it. This fear is being alleviated. Elaborating on that, Alex, um, among all diseases, the one disease that the status quo, meaning the pharmaceutical investment business, needs most to continue its business, to stabilize, to cement its system, it's cancer. They can afford to allow, let's say, advances in osteoporosis that uh, decrease the number of uh, uh, bone fractures uh, without uh, major damage to its future existence. Uh, they can uh, allow uh, progress in this and that diseases uh, to kind of uh, mask uh, their principal business, but they cannot allow. They cannot allow cancer to disappear or being identified uh, as a disease that can be regulated or prevented. So long ago, they have initiated what uh, Dr. Netsuki mentioned, the fact of fear. In fact, it's, it's more than that. Uh, it's a psychological warfare on humanity that the pharmaceutical industry is leading uh, with the tool cancer. Keeping cancer as a death verdict is the platform, is a precondition for this entire investment industry to continue. Wow. Strong, yeah? Strong it is. Words, yeah. Mm -hmm. Really amazing information that you've shared. I, I'd like to stop, but I, I'd like to ask one more question because that would be a, a perfect ending for the interview. But I, there's one more question I want to ask you because you just mentioned children, children that are being taken from their parents. You know, I've had the opportunity to interview several parents that have had their children literally taken from them because they refused chemotherapy. Why do you see, why have we seen over these last couple decades this huge increase of children with cancer? Well, I will start, but um, one of the answers is that uh, during the phase of growth of the human body, cancer cells divide naturally, they multiply, otherwise we don't grow. Bones do. Our skeleton expands. And that's why we have uh, uh, already by natural means uh, the risk uh, that certain cancers are developing uh, as in the juvenile age, for example, osteosarcoma, a typical uh, form of uh, juvenile cancer, uh, develops during the phase of bone growth in the epiphysis, the growth zone of the, of the uh, bone. Uh, and uh, then we have this effect that uh, 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 chemotherapy uh, is uh, uh, offered as a solution and actually makes those cancers uh, ex really explode. We have the fact that um, by now 42 percent of all prescription drugs currently uh, offered and sold uh, in the United States, and for that matter in the Western world, are potentially cancerogenic, according to uh, U.S. statistics. Um, and so we have, uh, by, the very, um, by the very means of reacting to the problem of cancer, uh, by the way they do it, by the methods that are being used, we have uh, a very strong reason why there is this explosion. Plus. We have all uh, lots of environmental factors, nutritional factors, etc. Pollution, yeah. <clears throat> so the same factors, but like Dr. Rapp said, that children are vulnerable because their cells are already in this growing phase. It means that the enzymes that destroy connective tissue are active. And therefore, if there is exposure to carcinogenic uh, compounds, these cells can reprogram and start digesting this connective tissue indefinitely and other changes uh, occur. So it's a combination of, of different factors. 
Well, Dr. Rath, Dr. Nidwicki, um, thank you for helping us today to engage in our mission to educate, to expose, and to eradicate cancer. Um, I know that this has been a very informative interview for the, the viewers, and so I, I just really thank you for, for the fact that you're providing science-based natural medicine that uh, you know most medical doctors say, I want to see the scientific evidence. They've got it with these, with these treatments that, you, that you're currently using with these micronutrients. So I thank you for what you're doing and just keep up the good work. It's great to be on your team. Thank you. Thanks, Ty. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.